you know, I started my learning in, in tech when I was very young, and I started teaching in the public school system over 40 years ago when I was in fourth grade and learned that there were no California Indians left. There was one page on the mission system and one page on ISHI. And then now, as my children have grown, my son, who is now almost 30, had the same exact school book. What I wanted to say was, for the state of California, we've started a pilot program starting in the Sacramento City Unified School District. And I did a teacher teaching day with new curriculum. And part of when you add indigenous knowledge to your curriculums, and I urge you all to support California Tribal College, your charter schools, your Montessori schools. But what I, the question I asked during that teacher training was, when you now incorporate indigenous knowledge and other history into your public school system, be prepared for the dialogue that's going to happen within the classroom with those students. A, they want to know why for so long they have been not taught the truth. There are students who then become very angry. And then on the other side of that are students who become very depressed that knowledge of what happened to their ancestors and ancestors other children whose ancestors were part of that negative process, they want to know why it's been oppressed or suppressed knowledge. So there is a psychological side to the incorporation of indigenous knowledge and true history in the public school system. After being part of the public school system for all those years, it wasn't until I was leaving junior high that I found out that I was an indigenous person. Not that I didn't know, but I was never asked, what are you? Because in our home, these knowledge base that we're taught is just what we do. I didn't know I was being trained to be an herbalist. I just know that I had the knowledge that I knew. These stereotypes and labels were not put upon us. So it's a whole nother facet of incorporating ind indigenous knowledge, place, Based knowledge into the public system. The psychological factor of the students when they open up to the truth that they learn they were not being taught the truth, that we are all one, that the science of the stars is connected to the science of the water, that people and true knowledge has been oppressed. And it, it affects students at all ages very deeply. So while they're learning to just understand themselves and go through that introspective period, the opening up of knowledge that way has a profound effect on the human being's soul when those things have been kept as hidden knowledge for so long. So education's political. And the education system that in, in this country were not built for, to educate indigenous native children. They were built to annihilate the indigenous mind. And so it's really difficult and, and challenging in many ways um, to go beyond that because the way in which these institutions were built is the way they're gonna behave. They're built with a certain mindset and they're going to behave with, with that mindset. So I think we have a really huge challenge in dismantling these systems for everybody. And to find ways that we no longer privilege certain knowledge over other forms of knowledge, and that we're all a part of, of constructing knowledge from our worldviews and our understandings and, and teaching. And... It, it, in, in the communities I come from, the starting point for that and so sort of the leveraging towards success around that is really to, to step out of those institutions and build our own, you know, our own schools, our own systems. And I think early on of, of the, our tribal community colleges 
that were built for the communities, they, they, they are the communities, and of the demonstration schools and, and the different types of charter schools, now the language schools. Because for us, there's a recovery and there's a healing that, that we have to go through. Um, and at the same time, we, we, our children want, are, are forced into these schools and have to be in these schools. So what can we do as educators to really begin to, to think about the curriculum we teach, the teaching and learning environments we create, what knowledge is privileged over another form of knowledge? All of that is work that we can do now in, in these institutions. So... We have a lot of work to do, and um, I, you know, again, I just sort of appeal to all of you because we're all educators in some way. We can have a voice in that and change it. One thing, um, you know, I've been in education for for many, many moons, and um, it's a very different paradigm thinking about education through the Western lens and thinking about education through the cultural lens. Um, through the culture lens, it's very much a holistic thing. There is no separation between different types of sciences, no separation between politics and religion. It, it's very, very holistic. It's very holistic. Um, for me today, it, it's, I actually had to check myself before speaking because we are in a moon phase that in our world we would normally not speak on. We're in the, the ole phases which tends to be, um, <clears throat> in, in our traditions, no fishing, um, no planting, no bringing about, um, um, no trying to bring things up to fruition because the moon phase told us so. But it was a great time to get down and dirty, to get into the weeds, to start weeding things out. It is a great time to mend your fishing nets, great time to mend your relationships, great time. So, you know, there's always that, uh, that duality of thinking, that duality of doing. Um, and for us, that's something that we're all about. It's, it's, it's all or nothing. It's, it's really all or nothing. Um, I left the university system after over 15 years teaching in Hawaiian studies when I came to the realization that as policies were changing, I was teaching less of my culture and more about my culture. We learn by doing. We get the connection by being. We can't teach from a third-party outlook. So for me, that was kind of, kind of my realization that I, I could no longer be in, be in that setting. Um, I'm still in education, still in academics, but in areas that that worked better for me. Dismantling the ivory tower is uh, a big task. The ivory tower, right? Pretty phallic symbol, right? Seriously. So there's inherent patriarchy, hierarchy, classism, racism <laughs> embedded in uh, educational institutions. And sadly, education has done a lot of harm to Native people a lot of harm. And so it's no small feat to try to transform um, our educational systems. You have to be a word warrior, as Gerald Visner talks about, and um, really dismantle it from the inside out, some of those hierarchical systems. Uh, it's not for everyone, but we are a growing groundswell and we're starting to take over and we're turning, you know, ivory towers into learning lodges and, and longhouses and wigwams and roundhouses. So it can be done. That's what I'd say. Mahalo, Melissa. Um, for me, it, it's kind of interesting. Um, I'm fine with leaving the education system alone. <laughs> I'm fine with leaving it alone the way it is, as long as they can leave us alone. If we can get the ability to teach our children the way we need to, the way we want to, in a cultural setting, to me that is first and foremost. Um, in Hawaii, that's been done to a certain extent. 
Um, right now, we can go from um, six weeks old through a doctorate degree entirely in our language. Um, not about our language, but through our language. We have had to work through the system, and um, we, we, we've done it through university lab schools, through charter schools. Um, but if they could only just leave us alone and let us do what we know works for our kids. I came to indigenous knowledge or began to learn about myself as an indigenous person quite a bit later in life, I think, than, than most of these people uh, here did. I, I grew up without much of a, a connection. Um, I'll share a little bit of my story just to give you a little my, my background and my context, but my dad was... Uh, Separated, I guess, from his culture and things at a very, very young age. Um, uh, grew up in foster homes and, and uh, orphanage. And um, when he was a little bit older, his mom came back to pick him up and wanted to kind of start over, but things weren't so good there. So when he was 13 years old, he called social services himself and asked to be taken back in a care so that he could... He knew education was his only you know, option to have a healthy life. Um, and so I grew up without any connection to my family. I have cousins in the city I grew up with, in that, that I only met at my dad's wake. Um, I just didn't have that connection. And in a way, you know, he, he protected me and, and my sister. You know, I finished my PhD in January. My sister is doing her PhD right now. So he provided a lot of opportunities for us. And for him, education was kind of a way to do that. But it, it didn't provide him any opportunities to, to connect with who he was as, as an Indigenous person. That just wasn't part of his experience. And it, it wasn't part of my experience either, really, in K-12 school. Um, I think I had one lesson on Indigenous people in grade 7. Uh, there was a, a line drawing of an Indian on the overhead and maybe a handout, I think, of a buffalo. And, and we talked about, like, you know, Indians, you know, used to live here and they used all the parts of the buffalo. And that's kind of what I learned about, about First Nations people uh, growing up. And I knew that was part of my ancestry, but, you know, I had no idea anything beyond that. Um, so it wasn't until I went to university for me, actually, that I, I was able to reconnect. And I went to a urban teacher, edu native teacher education program. Um, at the University of Saskatchewan. First time I'd spent time with other uh, Indigenous people and got to know a little bit more of the history, a little bit more of the, the culture that I never was connected to. Um, and it was actually during my PhD, too, that, that I really got connected and, and I decided to, uh, to come home and really um, build some relationships. And, uh, you know, I never even heard the word Indigenous knowledge until I was in graduate school. Because um, it is different than knowing the history of, of, you know, indigenous people and all the things that have happened. But the idea that indigenous people, my ancestors, had their own knowledge system, their own ways of knowing, was, was totally foreign to me until I had a, a Maori Scottish master supervisor. And she's the one who, who suggested a lot of the work I was doing actually resonated with a lot of work indigenous scholars were doing. Although I wasn't drawing on that, I was looking mostly at Western scholars and, and ideas. So, so that was the first time that had been introduced to me. And, and I shared that not to be self-indulgent and, and tell my story, but because, you know, for my dad, education was a separation for things for him. But for me, education has allowed me to come, to come back. And, and even though, you know, I'm Métis, um, I've been learning to speak Cree. The opening words I said to you were in Plains Cree. Uh, as Métis people, we have our own language. We have Machif. Uh, we have our own culture. We're very, very strong, a nation of people. Um, and, you know, I, I thought when I... You know, I thought it'd be good to go back and connect, but my path has actually led me more to connect with, with Cree. And then during my, my doctoral research, I actually, uh, I had no idea that this would happen, but during my doctoral research, and this apparently can happen in universities now because it happened to me, but I basically became a ceremonial helper with a Lakota ceremonial leader. And I did that for two years. I still do it. I've been doing that for five years now, and it has profoundly changed my life and impacted my life and, and, and given, given me something to, to connect to. So... Um, so I want to share that, just talk about the changes that have happened and that these things, I think that's a unique situation, like kind of what I've been through, but those are the kinds of things that are starting to happen and our educational institutions are starting to shift. And I was very fortunate to have, you know, a, a woman who is Maori to, to point me in that direction a little bit and to have doctoral supervisors and university that would support my research and let me talk about my experience in ceremony and the things that I, I learned there. Um, for my actual doctoral research. So I wanted to, to just, you know, let you know that, that things are, are starting to change. It's not the norm and there's a lot of work to do, but that's been, been my experience and I feel like it's kind of brought me full circle. And now I work at a university where my, my job is to help teachers learn to do this work and to, to share, you know, Indigenous knowledge or at least share about Indigenous knowledge with their students to let them know that these things are, are 
are, are possible, that, that we have our own knowledge systems. And, uh, and so I feel really, feel really good about that. We get off the little stage and we change the space physically and sit in a circle. We're all asked to bring in something important to them personally and to their, their culture, whatever it is, and we make a collective space. Then everyone shares about their own personal story, and that brings the whole person into the room. Uh, we talk a lot about ancestral seeds and ancestral waters. We all come from them, so we bring the whole person into the room, and we slow down the pace and um, we sit in a circle where everyone is equal, everyone is a teacher, everyone is a learner, and um, that starts to create a safe space for um, sharing. I, I would agree uh, with that, Melissa. That's a lot of, of what I do is, is literally how you construct the space. Um, and... I, I, it's a, it's really challenging because when, as uh, um, Sage was saying, there, there's a huge impact as people begin to understand um, their histories differently. Uh, Non-Indigenous students are grappling with guilt and, and, and what they perceive as blame, and you know they're beginning to unpack that and. Um, uh, Native students are, are feeling, you know, this erasure of, of who they are in the curriculum, the history, and they're grappling with that and coming to terms. So it's a very, very challenging space to hold. Um, but I think you have to build, again, the trust and, and the trusted relationships within the classroom. Uh, you have to encourage students to take some risk but, you know, I always set really strong ground rules because they can't leave that safe space then and, and there's repercussions for their, their vulnerability. So it, it's really challenging for, um, for everybody. And as a backup, because I've done a lot of diversity work in higher education and, and in different contexts work with these issues, I always make sure that there's some kind of follow-up and, and some kind of resources students um, can turn to. And I'm always very transparent as well if I'm working with younger people, with their families and, and if necessary, the communities, about what's happening in, in a particular classroom at that time. I'll speak to safe space for collaborations outside of the classroom. Uh, more so when we're trying to collaborate between uh, Hawaiian studies departments and maybe marine science or anthropology or whatnot. Um, first off, I make sure we get out of the offices, off of the, um, off of the university, and onto the land. And then we eat. Who here does not like to eat, <laughs> right? We all like to eat. But then I encourage them to bring something that represents their culture, or their family, or themselves. And we sit and we get to know each other. We don't talk about collaborations. Not right, not right away at least. We get to know each other, we get to know what each other's all about. We get to understand each other's intentions. We make that connection here first. And then we bring in the analogy of, you brought something that was meaningful you to the table for us to eat here. Now as we're working through this collaboration, what is it that you bring to the table with you that our students can eat here and here? And we create that safe space for the, for the preparing, for the planning. And then once we get everything on the table, we're equal and we understand the goals that we want to collaborate to. The rest is just about getting dirty and doing it. Mm -hmm.